ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, back to the show. I'm not sure if this is publishing uh, on your side, Brandon, or my side, but uh, kind of we had a conversation this weekend that uh, it was is kind of interesting in a sense. I am friends with one of your lead builders, Zach. Yes, and I are friends, and in fact, he built the 105 uh conversion that i have from the saiga he's all right he's uh, okay you know oh come on he's a good guy he's fantastic he's we were we were lucky to have him so he uh he he brought it up he was we i initially started talking to zach about the ak-12 about some of my sentiments on it and then out of the blue it came up that you were working on a very similar topic this weekend as we were filming the AK-12 after ev evaluating it for about, you know, two and change weeks and some some rounds down the pipe, pushing it a little bit. And uh, the weird thing is your title to the video was strangely similar to the sentiments that we got to the AK-12. And so... Today, afterwards, I actually found out, too, that Giga over at Polinar Tactical over in Slovenia, turns out they were also working on an AK-12 video. And they seem to have similar sentiments. It's almost now, like we're all coming to the same conclusions about certain things. Yeah. And, and now I've got to emphasize, none of this was scripted. We did not know each other's plans on filming. It just by chance, this one weekend turns out in multiple places in the world... All of us were working on AK-12 content together. Don't worry. It doesn't matter. People in the comments on all of ours are going to claim that we stole it from each other. So it, it's yeah. all good. We're, we're all thieves. So the AK-12, I think you posed a question which is really worth looking into. Did Russia adopt a crummy rifle? I, I don't think you use the word crummy. Uh, but uh, did Russia adopt a bad rifle for their next generation service rifle? Right. Does the AK-12 commit certain forms of fellatio? Uh, yeah. I believe that was the that was the question posed. Yeah. So, I we see the AK-12 due to its rarity uh, anywhere in the world outside of Russia and now Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> Due to its rarity, I'm, I'm sorry. We're, okay, we have to emphasize this is not a Stomp Russia video. Even though some pretty horrific and tragic things are happening around the world tied to their names, this is a, an academic review or an academic look on the AK-12. A yeah, technical, much, technical discussion. Yeah, yeah. As much stupid stuff as we throw onto our videos, all three of us, you, I, Giga, we're sort of AK nerds at heart. I mean, you were very much so starting a YouTube channel based off of AKs. But uh, how how did it come to our conclusions? First of all, what, what was your conclusion after looking at it, if you may, in, in a short uh, sentence or, or just few? Right. Uh, the, the I guess the TLDR on it is that it allows you to do a lot of things out of the box, like from the factory that the AK-74M and the AK-74 does not allow you to do. So there are certain technical upgrades um, that are, I guess, objectively upgrades as far as bringing the rifle into the 21st century, uh, along with uh, like to the capabilities that a lot of Western equipment can do. But I think they massively missed the mark as what, uh, as far as what they could have done taking inspiration from the aftermarket, which is what actual operators are using and continue to use. Uh, they, they had everything laid out in front of them. They had a blueprint to what everybody kind of drifted toward, and they knowingly went the opposite direction on a lot of things. And also, uh, so to add on to part of what you're saying, Giga, in a short conversation this morning, described the rifle as a rifle that was full of disappointments and missed opportunities. And this is going to upset some people, what I'm about to say. And I think you probably know what I'm about to say, because I told you yesterday that I think this is a Russian version of the burial 25 years 26 years after the burial existed the Vizor 96 a burial uh, or burial and uh why 
I think so because basically on the modernization process of the uh, the Vizor 96, the Poles basically took an AK-74, well, Vizor 88, the Tantal, basically does the same thing as an AK-74, right? And gave it a sturdy optical mounting solution on top. And it has... Um, attachment points for lights and various foregrip attachment items and you could switch between a folding or a collapsing stock which is in my opinion basically what the AK12 is because it is not laser compatible with the uh, very wobbly foregrip it's not a good idea you could theoretically do it it's just you're you're talking about the the loss of just retention of zero is beyond a hundred yards, completely impractical. Right. I mean, this it's basically what you were saying before, you know, the, the blueprint was laid out for them. They have multiple social media videos with their FSB alpha boys running around with an, a zenited out clash uh, 74 or depending on which, Spets team you're talking about. Some of the Soberteric units were running around with 103s mm. and 104s, so a 762-centric seven, uh, 100 series, which it makes, it makes me wonder if the AK-12 was an evolution or a devolution of things. And um, a lot of times when I look back at it, and you're looking at... Um, okay, so why modernize, right, Brandon? Mm. You're trying to, you're trying to equalize your playing field and and match up with what the West is doing, namely using optics and night fighting capabilities. So, right. effectively, <sighs> you are able to mount optics. Yes, correct. This one has a one P eighty seven on it, but you don't issue them. Yeah, or and or rather, oh, this is mm, yeah. Mm. You uh, might have issued them, but they didn't quite get there, huh? Yeah. Well, okay. That that is the right way of putting it. So, <laughs> so uh, the end state is there are no optics that are on some of the the rifles that are that are out in the field. It's right? like a corruption game of Chinese telephone. It's like they started here with everything. What actually made it to the field after it went through eight different hands? It ended up into some cloner's pocket. And the other and side on your gun up. here in the United States. Oh, right. Yeah. And the other side, it turned into the Colonel's pool. <laughs> so, um, oh, sorry. Uh, ah, let's, let's veer back into it. So <laughs> optic mountable items, right? And then you're talking about uh, night fighting capability. You've got your basic night fighting capability with your lights. And right. then your more advanced would be running night vision, which... <sighs> It's like you said, it's not that you cannot mount a laser on it and use it. I mean, first right. of all, they don't seem to issue the lasers with them to begin with, but that's neither here nor there. Um, or the night if, vision for that matter. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm hearing a lot of it I'm not in the practical sense, just a lot of stories of, of them getting completely murked in the dark because uh, Ukrainian uh, special forces operators know that they have no night vision capabilities, or at least certain units don't. And they're just going in and they are cleaning house a little bit at a time, chipping away and just attacking at night, which makes perfect sense from a, a pragmatic perspective. If we're looking at the Ukrainians really uh, receiving a lot of the Western training and, and, and Western assistance into modernizing their forces into NATO standard, which is what you're trying to match from the Russian perspective, it seems like... And, and to your to your point, it seems like they missed the mark on a lot of that modernization program to really hit that. And and this is just me. I feel like they could have just kept the 74Ms, just bought Zenico B13 side rails and just bought whatever Chinese hollow sun they could get and just issue them with hollow suns on them and get probably the entire VDV with red dot sites, which would have done more than yeah. this with no optic. Completely agreed. I mean, it, it the AK-12, it, it makes no sense to spend this much money on the entire program as a whole, from the Zlobin all the way forward to what we currently have and the new iterations that are kind of coming out. 
Um, I, I would put, <laughs> they're still like working on like a update, like a rolling update, I believe, of using the AK-19 stocks now on the AK-12. It's like, look, your problem isn't the stock. Your problem is the fact that you spent all this money on figuring out how to mount an optic and make it hold zero on a mass producible AK dust cover. And you're not issuing the optics that you designed this to take. That is a kind of a big oversight. Now I've heard, I, now this is unconfirmed. I've heard some people saying, uh, some people who are closer, I don't know if they're like truly in the in, but closer to the in saying that some of their officers were not issuing the optics because they were worried that their troops would lose them, which then is an indication to their command structure. And uh, I have never were... heard that. And I, I, it doesn't sound implausible. I will, I will, I, okay. <laughs> I will say this. It will upset some people on, on our side. I have that had ha, I've have had that happen to me before. I mean, for Christ's sake, in combat. They, yeah, com yeah. They they freaking Brandon. They deployed me with an M sixteen A two in two thousand and twelve. Oh my god. We remember I was in Europe, and this was pre the build up of Russia going into Crimea. So right. Europe was very much a forgotten child of the U.S. Army. I mean, it had a large footprint. But a lot of the stuff that we were issued, like my Humvee was from 1985. It was just continually maintained. It was, it was a piece of crap. But it was continually maintained enough to where it would just run. Um, obviously, I didn't deploy with the base runner that I had in Germany over into Afghanistan, right? I mean, you were using MRAPs and whatever over there. But, but I received an M16A2 nonetheless. Now, I received it under circumstances that I was a late deployer, so they had issued a lot of the weapons out. Right. So I had a choice of either being the officer with an M249 para <laughs> or a, an M16A2. And for me, I'm, I've been in the uh, target rifle scene enough to where I'm far more comfortable with an A2 um, than an M249. Which they uh, also and, seem to run more predictably. I, I guess is the way of putting that softly. Right. But, but this is the difference here though. I was not going into air assault operations yeah. with an M16A2. I mean, so there's a, there's a bit of a difference right there when you're dropping going into a friendly country. And I, I, I had much less of a propensity of receiving that amount of fire. I was not seizing an airfield, let's say. Right. With an M16A2. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know what that says about the potential issues in the command structure, if that were true. But uh, there's a difference, too, between like issuing all of your rifles and equipment, and then you came along late and they're like, ah, here's what we have. And the, whole, the full frontal first assault, they're like, you know, we could give you guys optics for this. Like, we have them. We have them. But honestly, we did the math and you're worth less than a commulator. So um, no, no, we're just going to hold on to those for the, for the good guys. See, the thing, I really don't understand this. The thing is, their optics, the hollow, the 1P87s, like the one back here, mm. I would take a hollow sign over that yeah. if I had to jump. Like, I mean, there's no yeah. if, then, or buts. A hollow sign, lasts, the, the battery life is better. The uh, Even if it's a single dot, it just makes way more sense. It's lighter. It's more compact and it's cheaper. Yeah. I, I mean, I've never, ever been impressed by Russian glass. Uh, any, especially their, 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 let's, let's maybe bring that into like, you know, taking the historical context out of it, like maybe like seventies forward, especially once you start getting like the PK06 or something like that. It's, it's, it's terrible. I mean, they had, it seems, it's just the entire system seems like such a departure from the AK 100 series. Yeah. Because when you look at look back at the 100 series, you're looking at standardizing the entire line's parts. All you have to do are switch out minor items. You solve <clears throat> solved is a big word cuz I know you and I both like the crink. Right. Uh, let's be honest here. If you are air an air crew and you drop down uh, and you had to choose between a 105 and a 74U 
that that like 13 and a half inch barrel or 12 and a half inch barrel is far superior i don't know what it is that 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 short little bit more of a barrel squeezes so much more i guess you're doubling things. i mean well you're adding 50 percent to it if you think about it that's, i guess that's true it's not an insignificant amount but I, I guess the 105 is what the the crink always should have been i suppose that's not going too far i but mean the crink is always still like that's gonna that's gonna have a special place in in the heart just because it's, yeah. it's sexy I mean, it's it's a warlord rifle. Let's let's face it. But and the 105 is not. But the 105 is a Spetz rifle once you kit it out. And I don't think if we were to dial it back, I have this conversation with H and K guys all the time because people a lot of times complain about H and K the the MP5s. Um, that uh, you, you, okay, so they're heavy. Yes, that that you cannot take away weight from the way it works. You're not going to make a polymer MP5, but People always talk about it lacking Picatinny rails on top. Uh, but then one of the arguments is then also that you could slick the entire thing out and run it extremely lightweight or lighter weight and very slick to where it has less snag points, which if you have an AK-74 with a modernization kit, you could always drop down to a more slick configuration, which if you're not running optics for your troops would be actually more beneficial for paras to have less snag points. And that giant cheese grater on top is a massive snag. Actually, you know the um, Bren 806, uh, Bren 805s, the Bren 1. For I, the, I know uh, them. Season. I'm not intimately familiar. One of the complaints that the Czech paras had uh, when they first fielded the 805 was that the top rail was not uh, the the edges were not rounded enough and they kept mm. on ripping holes in a lot of their kit. And so when you're talking about having a pick rail on top and not running optics, it's actually a detractor when you issue that to troops, because then it turns into a snag point or a point to where it just gets, it can run into issues. Right. And it takes more machine time to, to, to produce. No, a hundred percent. Well, so I guess getting back down to the core of it, the one thing that I, no, I, I, I actually just started thinking about this now talking to you, um, that I think the thing that bothers me the most about the 12 and the setup that it has currently is the, uh, the fact that this is probably the biggest mechanical and assembly departure from the AK that has ever happened, ever. Like this is the, the since the type one, uh, because it's fundamentally changed how the, you've deleted the rear sight block. Aside from like, like Russia has never done that before, at least to my knowledge. Like you've got certain things like the, the Galils and such that have kind of integrated stuff like that. But Russia has deleted the front side or the, uh, the rear sight block. Uh, the gas tube is now permanently affixed to this weird piece that was like custom built to sit in the place of the rear sight block, but welded to the front trunnion. Very bizarre. Um, the gas tube is now completely fixed in place. You have a completely new dust cover unit. You have a, a, a gas plug on the gas block. Like it, it, these sound like a bunch of little things, but, and maybe they are, but this is uh, the biggest mechanical departure as far as like lack of interchangeability, just complete shakeup of the way it works. Machining entirely new parts that are not interchangeable with the old stuff, kind of a new fire control group set up, a lot of different things, like a completely new rear trunnion and the way that the entire assembly attaches and the, the way the gun takes down is completely different. You've had minor changes, like the way that, you know, the stock, the folding stock works on, like, for example, the RPK-74, where they, they change that mechanism. But I've never seen anything like the what they've done with the AK-12. And they were clearly not afraid to change things. They just didn't change things for the better. Like it, that's, that's the problem. Like, you, you're going all this way to change up and make sure that these are completely different parts designed from the ground up. And what did you do with that? You have the biggest mechanical departure the AK has ever had, and you end up with what? Right. So if you're looking at the... Let, let's look back at the AK-100 series. All those change-ups between the 74 to the 74M and subsequently the 100, you ended up with an entire family to where all you had to change were the bolts and the barrel. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you, had, you could change between the 101, 102, 103, 104, 105. You had all those models and all those different calibers that could all exist, 
by just those two parts within the AK that you could change up. And as far as the barrel assembly goes, they went, they even standardized that where they're all now utilizing the 90 degree gas blocks. They're all utilizing the 24 millimeter front sight blocks uh, with the threads integrated onto the block. Everything was standardized. And that makes perfect sense. If you're going to be producing a lot of these guns at 556, 762, 545, there's no reason like between the AKM and the AK-74, they changed up a lot of stuff. It wasn't interchangeable. But on the 100 series, they fixed all that. So now you're, instead of throwing out a number, producing 100,000 uh, of each barrel component for a 762, 100,000 of each barrel component for a 545, and same for 556, you're just producing 300,000 of the same part, which really kind of streamlines your production. Right. It lowers the operational cost. It lowers the inventory cost for the factory itself. Mm -hmm. It decreases the material wasted. Uh, and it decreases, most importantly, the machine time and the manpower yeah. wasted on all those single, all those little parts. And this, the weird thing is the original, the old version of the AK-12, like the first uh, version, what was it, 2012 when they debuted it? I think it was 2011, according to Wikipedia. Um, you know, the, I don't. You, you, you probably know better than I do. I, I haven't done the deep dive on the history set yet, but that the first one is v massively different from the AK-12 we see right now. Yes. Uh, have you ever done any digging into the, the, that prototype? I have not. Uh, I don't know how many are even in existence. So that that's kind of a cool part. I, so I, I like this part of it. Um, that that's what's referred to as the Zlobin. Uh, prototype and it is funky I, I i like it a little bit apparently they had a lot of issues like there's more data has come out like i think recently there's been some articles that have been translated where they're describing and i think vlad onakoy has some says some good stuff on that but uh some of the problems that they were facing uh, in the early field trials of that but they tried to do a lot as if you notice like they deleted the AK selector that acts as the dust cover. They didn't deleted the need for that because they put the charging handle further forward and on top. So they just had a little clearance there on, on the front instead of bringing it to the rear where the operating mechanism of the gun was. They tried to do a lot of interesting stuff with uh, with the Zlobin. And uh, I, I, I would like to see, like I would like to get my hands on one and I'd like to see what kind of issues they were running into. And if that was just regular, I guess, uh, like, teeth cutting kind of stuff on a new prototype or if that was a complete failure of the design but either way it didn't seem like russia was having it well i mean it was too expensive for them to begin with and then it failed a few reliability trials which in in my opinion your reliability trials on on early prototypes i mean brandon like, you, you know with the ak-50 i mean you get ragged <laughs> yeah. on all the time I mean, prototypes are going to blow up. I mean, yeah, okay, you make 10 of them. Thankfully, like, none of ours have. Uh, fingers <laughs> crossed to uh, knock on some wood. Okay, but but prototypes are where yeah. you figure out where, where things go wrong. You figure that's out the where... the purpose, you... for the most part. Like, And that's where things get political. Because like the purpose of a prototype is figuring out, okay, what is our problem? How can we fix that without breaking everything else? And then come out with a new iteration that fixes those things. And okay, what did we break? What is still broken? do another one. And then when you have uh, generals come in and, you know, they're trying to, you know, make their points and, you know, get their new stars and uh, shoot down the prototype, you know, this production gun will never work. The AK-74 works fine. It's like, well, yeah, but that's not what we're doing here. And that's the other part of it, you know, having the political side and the timing side to make sure that a prototype is adopted. I mean, this is an interesting thing to look back on U.S. history, though. Yeah. So the yeah. M14 is very much a design by committee uh, beast, which is why it's great. It's interesting. It <laughs> is interesting. I mean, <laughs> I have an M21. I I like it, but not on. I would not take it into. I would not take it into Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of guys did, but I would not. Yeah. Um, and it's because I own it, and I've shot it a lot, and I know a lot of quirks about it. But right. It very much has a lot of issues, you know, with it. I mean, stemming from the magazine, which is the heart of a rifle. But um, I would say if we're looking at the M14, people always rag about it, saying that the M4, if we didn't adopt the M14, we would have had the foul. Which, in my opinion, the foul is just, eh. it, it looks cool. It has a cool history. I would choose a G3 over a foul personally. I 
don't think the battle rifle was a good concept going forward anyways. And if we adopted the foul and we held on to that battle rifle concept for longer, we would have never adopted the AR. And so your your homeboys, the AK boys, would reign supreme uh, <laughs> there on after. I'm, it's interesting you say that too, because uh, the fouls for what they are, like I, they're they're awesome. They're cool looking guns, and they they work pretty good. There are it's it's the other AK-12 thing. It's like, man, you made some decisions here that I am really not sure about. Like the whole uh, recoil, like the the little tab sticking or the 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 long plunger sticking out of the bolt carrier that mm -hmm. runs all the way through to the back of the stock for seemingly no reason because they deleted them on later models. It's like, okay, so, so why did you do that in the first place? Because that seems incredibly sketchy. One that I think we should really look at in this case. So the, uh, the adaptation of the SCAR, we've actually had conversation about the SCAR. The SCAR 17. Oh, nice. Literally just sitting yeah, on my again. desk. I have like four firearms. I just moved. I've got four guns in my house right now. SCAR is one of them. I really dig uh, it. Unscripted. Again, I have no <laughs> idea how this happens. But the, the adaptation of the SCARs, the, the Mark 16, not the heavy, the, the light, that was not smooth sailing in the first place. Right. I mean, they originally had like crack stocks, cartridges going into the opera channel and issues with the magazines, all sorts of things. First of all, Amer the um, SOCOM rejected it after troop trials, which, you know, talking about a feedback loop with something where we could talk about the AK-12 in a bit on the feedback loop. Uh, but then FN took the time to really refine the SCAR a lot and turn it into something that is much more interesting nowadays without a lot of those early prototype issues. Yep. But my question is, if they had the current model SCAR-16 that, that they had submitted back then, uh, would that have meant that it would have been adopted by SOCOM? And the 416 would then not be a thing? I mean, it's an interesting question. I... I, I... I was actually unaware of a lot of the issues uh, that it had early on. I know this, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say how I know this. It's one of those things where I'm like, ah, I, I know I was told this, but I'm not sure. I, I, I'm pretty sure I could tell the information, but uh, I because I don't, I don't pay attention to what's public and what's not. The, the 16s, ten, yeah. What's ten that? years should ten years about D class, but if you don't want to talk about it, don't talk about any class. I, I just won't tell. I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's classified. I just don't want to like mention who I heard this from. Yeah, uh, we'll try the, offline about it if you do, if you don't want to. It's the Scar 16S, I think, had the uh, the uh, highest reliability rate in the uh, like the modern 16S is the most reliable uh, combat rifle that the U.S. military has ever tested. As far oh, as like really? failures per thousand rounds, kind of thing, or per ten thousand rounds, it was some standardized test. I don't recall the the specifics of if it was sixteen thousand rounds, thirty thousand rounds, something like that, but. Um, it, it beat out everything else as far as reliability. Right, but but that that took time to refine it. And we oh, yeah. didn't just go in and, and adopt the Mark 16 and issue rifles with bum stocks and, and rifles that would throw cartridges into the opera channel. Yeah. Uh, which mm, I mean that's 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 a whole can of worms. But but what SOCOM did instead, instead of adopting a new rifle, was adopt the M4 Block 2, which is a modernized M4 with a rail that accepts night vision devices and has a flat top to use optics. <laughs> yeah. What a concept. <laughs> which, incidentally, is what a modernization program currently that we look at is typically chasing after. Yeah. Um, and subsequently, we run into the four sixteens and stuff like that. But I, I can't, I can't help but wonder if there's a feedback loop problem because the reason the scar was pushed out was because of that feedback loop. Operators came back, said, "Hey, these are the issues. These are some of the problems. We should not go for it." And then the procurement side or command for SOCOM says, "Got it. Agreed. Noted. FN. Sorry." That's what happens. And which makes happened? FN say that we already spent a whole lot of money on this. So let's let's figure out if we can tweak these things and you know make this something that they actually do want to buy. 
Right. So w- w- with this one, though, um, that makes me wonder about this one because any shooter out there, you, you, it, I guarantee you, if I mean you, the FS, FSB Alpha guys are not idiots. I mean, yeah. we look at the kits they run. We try to emulate their kits in the states to clone it and then test it, and it's actually really good. Uh, I don't know if it's that handguard or not, but the Zenicode Out 74 that Josh has is performing way better than the pre Zenico 74 that we had. Really? In what in what regards uh, specifically? Uh, when we were pushing it on long distance accuracy. Uh, by the time this goes out, we'll you'll see it. I could send it to you after too. But uh, basically, for that one, we cleared the course in 19 rounds, which rivals NATO rifles. Yeah, wow. Uh, in in high winds too. We had 30 mile an hour winds, and I shot basically let's see, 152, 253, 354, 455, eight targets, two rounds each. I had three misses. Oh my god! Out of yeah, 500 that's, yards. That's fantastic. What what were you running? Was it just irons? Uh, no, I was. Okay, running thank God, the, I was like, you're you're okay, man. Jesus. No, <laughs> I'm not the VDV, my friend. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, <laughs> it was the the dual dot EOTech, so the EXPS three dash okay. two, uh, which is what a lot of the alpha guys are running over there. Maybe that's what I'm running on my twelve currently. Yeah, the dual dot is actually really good. You zero one dot at three hundred meters, and the other one at f- roughly goes in at five, and so you cover the entire distance, the entire effective range of the five four five by three nine so the exps three dash two even though it was not designed for five four five actually performs very well for five four five but regardless um the zenit code uh 74 the what the what people like to call the the alphas Mm -hmm. that program in dropping rails high quality rails onto the 74 and creating that solid surface in the front um, or chassis as essentially running in the direction of where SOCOM went back then when they rejected the SCAR and dropping, well, they already were running block ones, but then the block twos. So the, the long wrist rail pushing all the way um, to the muzzle device of the M4. And so then they would drop their IR in the front and they would have the same type of base design rifle as essentially the XM177 that was used in Vietnam with a 14.5 inch barrel, of course. Right. But with a modernization, ki- an effective modernization kit. So you're taking a very proven platform that has a lot of interchangeable parts between the long and the short rifle. Does that sound familiar? And then putting a really, really top performing, uh, refined modernization kit and it just works wonders in modern combat. And it has instead some, it, of it, it, instead it's like, of it, oh sorry yeah go, go oh, no it. no 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 go ahead go ahead no, instead of this is what I'm saying. Oh yeah, I, I, I it, it goes right up with uh, with Russia's continue kind of like the ideology of rejecting a lot of the West, like rejecting Western equipment and Western doctrine and things, but still kind of like. Oh, that's kind of cool. Can we have something like that? And and just kind of really chasing after it. Uh, and and it's, even if they're not doing it directly, a lot of the aftermarket companies are. Like uh, the Sure Shot. Uh, I love the Sure Shot Armament Group. Like the Mark III. It's a fantastic way of solving the problems while staying true to the AK. Because that's what a lot of American aftermarket companies really don't understand. Is they don't like they understand how to make uh, make. Uh, accessories and things for the air 15s and then for the Americanized platforms, they don't understand the, the, the ideology, I guess, behind uh, making AKs and what makes them tick. And so you'll get some weird stuff or some stuff that is, is close, but there's, there's a lot of just weird, weird stuff that, you know, you can't explain why it's wrong, but it's just wrong. Uh, whereas like companies like sure shot armament group and, and, you know, Zenico and things will take, the same charge as far as, oh, we want to be able to run a dust cover optic rail and we want to run uh, these longer handguards with, uh, with Picatinny or, or ability to accept M- uh, M-Lock or whatever. And they'll do a much better job at it. Like the, the, Mark, uh, the, the Mark III rail is probably my favorite and I'm, I'm holding out for the Mark III Slim because it's just, it, it's less bulky, it's probably lighter and it, it, uh, well, it is objectively lighter. 
and it just it has that cool look to it while also being pretty practical as far as a lot of that stuff goes and it's and it always comes back to like, I don't mean to bully the AK-12 for not being Zenico, but that's exactly what I have to do. And oh, did you even see, uh, I mentioned this in, in my video, the uh, Zenico did their own rail for the uh, AK-12. Actually, Nick, you know Blue Gene Operator? I, I have talked to him, I think, a couple of times before. He seems like a cool guy. We just never met. No, he's, yeah, he's a Ranger Edge guy. Ranger Edge guy. He, uh, he shot me uh, the Sport 12 kit. Yep. To, to look at it really interesting but at the same time it, it it goes back to the question why even bother with the ak-12 then if you're dropping a zenico rail on it afterwards <laughs> right to do the exact same thing and okay i, I will also go on this minor gripe as well uh, I, didn't, I didn't mention this but i should have it, the polymer that was used on the ak-12 reminds me of an airsoft gun it, it looks like it was very nicely nylon 3d printed it's not good quality it's like Keltec brand plastic it doesn't seem like they put a, enough uh reinforcement fibers in there no uh, it, it, i don't know it, it's mm, yeah and you can yeah. bend it with your hand too if you grab the barrel and gas you, you can physically move uh the hand guarded relation to the barrel it's i can roll in some of my videos and doing that because that's that's honestly yeah that that's a huge concern like free floating First of all, I understand why free-floating things are awesome if you can yes. have a continuous surface. But free-floating a rail for the sake of saying that it's a free-floated rail, why? Yeah. Your, your Swiss SG550s and 551s are quite accurate long-stroke piston systems. They are not free-floated. No. And, and really, there's... There's no real advantage, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it, I don't feel like there is a, that's a better way of phrasing it, I suppose. I don't feel like there's a huge advantage to free, fro free floating things on a long stroke gas piston gun before the gas block. To me, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to prioritize. So, so I think a lot of people get uh, side sidetracked by some buzzwords sometimes i'm not saying free floating is bad i'm not it's most certainly not bad i mean it helps with accuracy yes but it might not help um, what you're sacrificing to get it right right and and a lot of people i think they they hinge on some concept like um we we get this every now and then saying that when we're shooting a free float uh ar if the barrel even remotely touches the bag that i'm resting the a the rifle on uh there will or will not be comments in the comments section saying that oh well obviously <laughs> that threw it off the barrel harmonics are entirely <laughs> thrown off meanwhile you've got you know homeboys over in the on the eastern side rolling rolling around with barrel mounted bipods just cranking rpks off now that is not as accurate and that is automatic fire yes right uh but the effects of something touching the barrel it is there but it's not going to turn an ak-103 into a crink type of accuracy right but and it also depends on who's building your stuff too because i've and i won't call anyone out but i've received uh, at some point an AR-15 uh, platform, a high-end AR-15 platform rifle that was completely free-floated and was advertised like very, very accurate, you know, completely free-floated, uh, you know, free-float, free-float, free-float. And they had this weird booster thing on the front of the, uh, of the barrel that was shrouded by the handguard. And you could very, very clearly tell that the, uh, it's not a booster, but it was like a blast uh, shield the blast shield was contacting the end of the handguard. Like, guys, <laughs> come on. I mean, there's, <laughs> I mean there, there's, there's also instances that back in World War II, like Lee Enfields and Mosin Nagants, they had to have a certain amount of upwards pressure on the front of the barrel to dampen the barrel, the barrel harmonics. Really? Yeah. If you take okay. apart, especially, especially with uh, number fours, Lee Enfield number fours and even more so Lee Enfield number ones, because a number one barrel is even thinner than a number four. 
And so they used to use like, um, I think it's like either felt or leather or like a thin strip of one of the two. And the armorer had to put about five or seven pounds worth of upwards pressure on the stock to contact the barrel. And that was to remove some of the barrel whip. So for those particular models, you did not want it free floated. Otherwise, there would be too much barrel whip and it would make it worse. That is interesting. Yeah, I did. I don't doubt that for a second, but that is that's kind of neat. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes when I get to Mosin Agantin and it's not shoot, shooting accurately enough, uh, it sounds like it sounds so garbage rod rod ish because like I'll take like old ammo, so it's like Soviet ammo boxes because they're thick enough and I'll soak <laughs> it in oil. And then I'll pull the barrel up enough and they just like slide it an, up in the front. So it just contacts it enough to give it that little bit of pressure to dampen the, the little whip barrel that's inside. If, if it sounds stupid, but it works, it's not oh. stupid. It, it's right. it, It's like the most Tarkov thing you'll like you <laughs> take apart some of my guns. Like it's got like Soviet writings on the side of the box <sighs> that I, I didn't even cut the nice part of the box. I have a feeling that the Kalashnikov concerned engineers were kind of had their hands tied on part of this. Do you think that whoever commissioned this project had been listening to troop feedback or had a good feedback loop to tell them what was going on? And I, I sort of know the answer, but I mean, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I'm not sure at the end of the day that it mattered. Even if they did, I'm, I'm curious. It's probably came down to the amount of money that was already spent on the Zlobin and how much money that was spent on the AK-12 iteration as we see it today. And they probably just shut the valve off. They're like, okay, get it as good as you can possibly get it right now. Okay. Oh, you, you got these changes you want to make? You know, go pound sand. Uh, we've already dumped X amount of money. This is how much money you had to start with. We are... Four million over budget, you're done. You're, you're done. Game. Uh, put down pencils. Your test is over. I do have word from one of my sources that it, they were under immense political pressure to just basically poop out a new rifle, which but they seems, succeeded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but so the weird thing is, I mean, are they? Do you do you feel I? This just does not, when you're talking about the continuity of, of Russian arms manufacture, they always manufactured things with a goal in mind. There was always a good requirement set that went into it. But this requirement set seemed not goal-based, but rather objective like, or feature-based. So if I, if I want a car that could traverse uh, a more narrow pathway uh, down a cliff, let's say, and I asked an engineer to design something for me. And I made him say, I, I, I said, you have to design a car that could drive through very narrow pathways. And he designs me a car, a four wheeled car that only has one seat in, in the, in the, you know, steering column. Right. Then you come out with a really crappy car that would bank left to right and flip over very easily, right? Sure. Whereas what the engineer should have said is, let me design you a mountain bike that has two wheels so you could traverse on more difficult terrain without, with more control over, you know, whatever you're, you're wherever you're trying to get to and, and traverse through more difficult terrain. Right. But that's not a car, but there was sort of the engineer feedback loop <clears throat> as well. Yeah, there should have been like, I need a tool that will do this and not, I need a hammer that will do this. Like, no, I just need a tool. Like, whatever right. that looks like, this is the objective. We want to, you know, kill people at this distance with this and be able to do X, Y, and Z. It's something that we've, we've said before, I, I think just talking around the shop, uh, is it feels like the AK-12 was handed to a separate group of engineers afterward, and each... Like it was like a team of eight dudes that each got handed a different piece and then they just threw them all together with no concept of a finished product. Uh, or no, there was no producer or director to bring everything together and make sure it all worked in harmony. Somebody got the buttstock, somebody got the foregrips, somebody got the magazine, somebody got the dust cover, 
Uh, somebody got the, the muzzle brake area, you know, it just, it, and then they just slammed it all together like a big Mad Libs puzzle, ran out of money, and then had to produce that. That, that, is, that is my guesstimate of, of what happened with that program. And I mean, maybe at a future date, we'll get an answer out of that. I, I don't foresee that answer coming to light anytime soon, quite frankly. Uh, and then what's annoying is that there are people, and I know for a fact that this is probably true. Well, I, that doesn't make any sense. I know for a fact that this is most likely true. Um, there are people that are going to watch this that know the answer to that. And they, they cannot divulge one way or the other. Yep. Yep. I mean, we may be able to, to source check ourselves, but yeah. Right. At the same time, you know, some of, some of those guys, you don't want to give them up to. Yeah. So that actually makes a lot of sense when, when I'm thinking about what you guys at the shop are talking about. It seems like everyone's handed a different part. When I, that seems to match up with what I'm saying. It, it seems to be that some committee said that you need a collapsible folding stock. You need a, an optics rail and you need a free float handguard. You need a Picatinny rail. Instead of saying we need a weapon that could use good optics and fight at night. Right. Because... If they came out with that, I mean, Kalashnikov Concern came out with the uh, AKV-521, which is very, um, I mean, I know you like the SIG, the SG-550s, but it's, right. it's very, very, very um, similar in, in some aspects to the 550. But the right. 550 is able to solve a lot of that with the hinge open action, though, because right. then you have a solid top rail. Yeah, and, and that, that that solves a lot of a lot of problems, especially if you're not trying to go for like traditional AK disassembly, because there are a lot of limitations that you run into when you're trying to keep something like, oh God, uh, let me count the ways on the AK-50 project that you're trying to keep things AK, but it would be so much easier like if you have it again a design goal in mind, like you want a monolithic top rail. Doing that on an AK is very difficult uh, for a lot of reasons, and the more traditional you want to get with it, the harder that is. And so like the, the, the five, uh, 550 makes a lot of sense in, in a lot of those ways where it doesn't, it's not just, you know, if you, you look at it from a surface level, you're like, oh, they want to make it like an AR-15 where there's an upper and a lower. It's like, well, kind of, but not really. That wasn't really the idea behind it. It was more like overcoming an obstacle. See, but I don't like it when people say it's like an AR-15. Because you know, you you stink and know it that the Russian brass are going to going to be like, oh, but he's American. No, we we don't want anything American. No, no, no. We need so. I mean, the Russian. Yeah, it's like the the Simpsons thing where he bangs the desk like aha, and then it flips back over Soviet Union. Well, right, but but at the same time, I mean, we we do that sometimes here too. The entire concept of a semi-automatic sniper system that the Soviets really pushed hard. Yes. is a valuable concept. And yet it took us all the way to the 20... We were working on it with the M14 to the M21 project, but that really wasn't that great. So basically we had the Vietnam to the Panama years where we were trying to also delve into the semi-automatic sniper projects. Uh, but the Soviets always preceded us with the scope designs and reticle designs when it came to that semi-automatic sniper concept. Because I don't think they and, ever dropped that with the DMR. Uh, ever, like After World War II, I think that's something that they retained all the way through and obviously beefing up with the, the SVD and everything. Right. So that, that was that was one of the... So that's one of the big examples of this. You know, they went to Yevgeny Dragunov and they were like, we need a light enough weapon system to where you can hike in mountains with. Uh, we need this to be accurate enough because Dragunov was a target shooter, so his inclination would be shoot really tight groupings. And so that was directly conflicting with his design philosophy because then he would have to draw barrel weight, and that means a looser accuracy. But he freaking did it because he was designing to a set of design goals. Right. We need this to hike in mountains. We need this to be accurate enough to shoot torsos not targets yeah and i mean one of the was also you know because dragonov he made the barrel twist accommodate the optimal target load but then the soviets were like no we want explosive but uh that was also a lesson learned from world war ii 
Yeah. Because they were shooting a lot of um, PE ammo, the explosive ammo, against the Germans. And so the Dragunovs also seemed like a design set where they looked at it from a functional perspective rather than a features perspective. Because they were very well... If you went with that, like uh, the, the Romanians, they they took the opposite approach and they were like, give me an AK that shoots 7.62 by 54R. And then you end up with what could have been a, an SVD, but you have the PSL, which is... Uh, it's the SVD we have at home, Brandon. Yeah, that is that is the, the guy she told you not to worry about versus you. It's it's uh, like, it, there is nothing that grinds my gears more than when people call, oh, it's a dragon off. I'm like, no, no, it's it's not. It's really, do you, your 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 Honda Accord kit car looks very cool, but it's not a Lamborghini. That's that's it's not what this is. No, yeah, that's that's a really good example of that too. The AK12 sort of took that took that form, didn't it? Yeah, it, it seems to have a lot of functionalities that they said it has to have, like in the PSL sense, it has to have that thumbhole stock. Yeah, why, why? <laughs> the M76 is so much better. In all yes. those aspects, um, it has to shoot. Well, okay, I understand why it has to shoot fifty-four rim because because right. it integrates with a machine gun ammunition. They could just delink machine gun ammo and plus and they had in. a ton of it, a ton. Right, of it. but yes, the that itself. Oh my gosh, I. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, we're very much on the same page as as far as the PSL. I'm I'm also preparing some notes on the PSL actually personally. So oh, I, I can't wait to see you tear out a new exit poll. Uh, that because uh, there's so many little things on the PSL that once you know what you're looking at, it, it's just baffling. baffling Let's say the rear of the rear of the receiver. It's it's like you already made a new receiver. This is not a standard AK receiver. If they took a standard AK receiver, cut the the magazine farther, and then they needed a receiver extension, that makes perfect sense. But that's not what they did. You already have a new one. <laughs> I, it, it is such so the M seventy six and the PSL are so good duality cases on that. Yeah. On what you should do if you really want a a long stroke AK type sniper system. Or what you probably should not do to just fit the function into the form, you know? Oh, for sure. And yeah, and and the, the, yeah, leave it to the Yugos because they seem to uh, they they seem to have a lot more flexibility, or at least willingness to have flexibility in the design to be able to just mess with things and tweak things. And they did a lot of very unique stuff. Um, the M seventy six kind of included in that, where they they didn't just go with you know, an M70, but longer, you know, which they easily could have done. They kind of, um, I guess they just had a bunch of eight millimeter ammo uh, left over that they had said, yeah, well, okay, build a DMR at it. But yeah, it was. So they were using the M48s, the Mausers uh, back in World mm -hmm. War II. And then yep. on top of that, they were using the M53, which was an MG42 clone. Yeah. And so that's the same same thing as the Roma uh, Romanians and the Russians being able to delink uh, PKM ammo. Just drop it to their um, sniper, right? Uh, and just go go to ham, go ham with it. But the problem is, I mean, the PSL also exhibits such massive heat shift with uh, sustained fire. It's one of the worst ones that I've shot so far with heat shift. I believe that completely, and it's it's a pencil barrel for what they're trying to do with it. Uh, plus, a lot of weight at the end that is Which built onto the gun. Which, I mean, all this kind of goes back to the genius that uh, Dragunov came up with. I mean, he very much was able to fit that entire set of goals and succeed in it. And yeah. they, the, way, the way the Dragunov was adopted, they, it was a competition between three models, too. I was unaware so, of that. So uh, I think uh, Simonov, Dragunov... I forgot who the third one was, but there were, I mean, Dragunov was very much the underdog in, in this race. Um, but it was a competition between three rifles uh, um, for the, uh, the advanced sniper project that they were, they were uh, going for. And honestly, there is no other semi-automatic sniper system of that era all the way up into the two thousands that was even able to match it in my opinion. Yeah. And it, I guess it, it, it all depends on the, the parameters that you're given, I guess, especially with the context of Soviet doctrine, which, which a lot of these, especially like the, the, the Soviet satellite states, a lot of their ideology, their fighting ideology was based on 
being a defensive war where they were assuming the West was coming through them. And so it's okay. Your DMR just needs to be minute of, uh, you know, minute of Pollock at this distance uh, from, you know, and, and only shoot enough for, for, you know, if you've got an army moving forward through a valley before we lose this line and have to retreat another 400 yards back. You know, well, that's cold blooded, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the pre- this is I'm I'm merely reiterating the mindset of of the design choices here, but it's uh it's interesting to keep that in mind, I guess, with with some it, it not to apologize for some of the shortcomings of the platforms because there are plenty, but uh, I, I guess that's kind of what they were getting at. But I, I think I think Brandon, I mean, we're you know we're coming we're coming close to the hour mark here. We're, I think we've really looked at some of the d- disappointing features of the AK-12, and, and again, weirdly enough, all three of us, you, I, and Polinar, uh, Ziga, and Mancha, and Samuel, were looking at the AK-12 at the same time. Right. And all of us came up with the same conclusion that the AK-74 literally does the same thing and better when you modernize it. Yes. And so I would pose you with this question. As a shooter, I would not want to be, I would rather be deployed with a modernized 74. Or if I know I'm not issued optics, I would rather be deployed with a new manufactured, I need to make that clear, new manufactured AK 74M <laughs> right. rather than an AK 12. Would you prefer the AK 12 over a slick 74 if you were deployed right now? Mm. It's a difficult question, especially because it, it, it's not a hard question at all if you pose it in the, the way of like uh, a modernized AK-74, like such as like a, a Zenico 74 or a uh, short shot or anything like that. It's not even close. Like that, that is the obvious answer. So I guess it depends on how you define modernized. But if it's just a uh, just like a slick uh, as it rolled off the factory in 1990s AK-74, I would probably go that direction if I if there was no chance of me getting optics any any if there's no chance of me getting optics any time moving forward from that point, uh, then yes, absolutely, because um, the the twelve just changes a lot of things and doesn't doesn't accomplish the goals that I think it was set out to do. Now let me ask you this then: a lot of collectors in the states. Well, not a lot of, but some collectors in the States, some discerning gentlemen in the States or ladies and gentlemen in the States have ended up with AK or AK-12 clones by some means. Let's just keep it at some means. I know not of what you speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a collector, as a gun nerd, as an enthusiast or an academic... Do you find the AK-12 interesting, and would you own an AK-12 uh, if it were to miracled, get miracled out of location A and into your lap, and you would not have any ATF repercussions? Well, the answer is yes, because I do. Uh, I do have one that uh, <laughs> we, we there was, you know, everything was done legal above board. Uh, it was rebuilt, and it's uh, a... Uh, now an NFA item because we post sampled it, uh, made it a, made it a machine gun, uh, converted it, added the original fire control group and everything, so we can actually mimic the form and function of, for example, the two round burst, uh, the full auto, everything. Uh, I think it's extremely interesting as like as as a, a major AK fanatic and and as a collector and a lover of history and I guess watching history being made in front of us with this gun, uh, for better or worse, uh, much like the rest of history. Uh, still being able to, it's, it's a cool thing to be able to have this and just realize that this is just part of a long line of things that came before it. And uh, it's the next step to whatever is going to come after it. Uh, in that regard, I think it's, it's really cool. Yeah. I think uh, Ian McCollum would agree with you on that. And, and me too. I mean, the, I would love to have a G41 uh, from World War II, uh, not a very successful model, but a very interesting nonetheless um, I think oftentimes it's interesting delving into some of the problem solving uh, mm-hmm. proce- proce- processes, but then I think what's more interesting to that is what we're doing right here, kind of peeling the onion back and kind of theorizing just as nerd to nerd. I mean, what what exactly 
came to generate something like this. Mm -hmm. And what onwards? Are we making modernization kits to the supposedly modernized AK system? Or are we learning from mistakes? Or are we just... Um, I, I should not have said mistakes. Are we learning from uh, incidents and right. uh, uh, feedback loops? I or... think now we're getting a lot more feedback than ever before on this particular weapon. Yeah. Hopefully it's... It, uh, well... I don't want to say that, but um, yeah, choosing words carefully. I am interested to see what some of the failures that they are experiencing with this particular platform, how that influences their decisions going forward, and if they care. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I I do think there there seems to be a lot. I mean, just from my perspective, it seems to have a lot of soul searching that needs to be done yes. on your theory of employment uh, of troops and logistics on uh, for this particular weapon system. I mean, one thing we, we didn't talk a lot. I don't know if you talked about it in your video. Uh, for instance, the Russians in their military, they do not delineate between co corrosive and non-corrosive ammunition. Well, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they they do not have a delineation between corrosive and non-corrosive stores of ammunition. That seems to be a little bit of an oversight. That's just how they are. I mean, they uh, yeah, logistics, uh, <laughs> Soviet logistics. Not uh, the strong but, suit. I mean, they they dictate that their soldiers are supposed to clean their rifles every day and every single time after patrol. It, from my American mind, that gives you a lot of vulnerability of having weapons offline. Uh, due to that, um, right. which is my thought. They also uh, like to think. build in a lot of chambers in said weapons that a lot yeah. of corrosive stuff can get into and is not very easy to clean, uh, whether that's muzzle brakes, uh, expansion chambers, gas blocks, gas tubes, gas ports. Uh, there's a lot of hard to clean stuff there. That's exactly where I was getting at. and And it seems like there hasn't, you know, on the feedback loop, whether it's between employment, logistics, or any of these cases, mm -hmm. your AK-74 and 74Ms or 105s are so much easier to clean if you have a logistics system that does not delineate between corrosive and non-corrosive ammunition. And, and, and a lot of this could come down to the typical, like, I guess, emperor has no clothes kind of uh, thinking that a lot of the Russian hierarchy has in, in their military system where... Uh, you're not going to tell your superiors that your your soldiers aren't cleaning their rifles every day because why the hell aren't your soldiers cleaning their rifles every day? The manual clearly says they're supposed to be cleaning their rifles every day. What's going on here? So they just don't talk about it. And so that goes to your feedback system. It's like if, if, they, if the people <laughs> who are in charge of this stuff think that that's what's happening in the field, even though we both know it's not, uh, then this continues to be a problem. And that's just yeah, a I minor mean thing. It's these are these are logistical problems. I mean, I'm not going to say America is, is is immune to it, but at the same time, you know the M1 uh, carbine, uh, mm -hmm. the the US M1 carbine. Mm -hmm. um, it's never been issued with corrosive ammunition before, ever, even World War II. And even when corrosive, uh, non corrosive ammunition has a shorter shelf life and is harder to store, America has never issued corrosive ammunition for the M1. Interesting. Uh, carbine, not Garand. Right. And that's because the gas system on the on the M1 carbine is hard to clean. And so logistically, you plan for that. You make sure that you're not using corrosive ammunition for a, a, a weapon system that is harder <coughs> to clean the gas system. But now the AK-12, I mean, you're screwed. You have all these facets that could, that corrosive ammunition could just sit there. Yep. And, and I mean, to be fair, they, they do issue a very, very nice field cleaning kit with it. <laughs> I mean, you mean the cleaning kit that could be integrated into furniture that could be integrated into a 74M? Yeah, exactly. It, it's almost like uh, for the last 60 years, we've had an integrated cleaning kit that has been part of the furniture of the gun. Really cool. That's a neat concept. I think it's, I think it's cool. Yeah, look, I mean, I... <laughs> 
I don't know. Like that's 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 what it comes down to. I think. I mean, you and I we're at a point. You're at we're at a strange location to where we could kind of peer into some of the interworkings through um, deductive reasoning, I suppose, mm-hmm. based on some of you know our personal experiences around firearms, Kalashnikovs, or logistic systems. And it's interesting, like you said, it's living through history. But yeah. uh, and, oh, and, and uh, real quick, the, the the thing that makes this really cool is also the the, introdu- the introduction of social media into this and the internet, because uh, between pr- propaganda, press releases from Kalashnikov, Concern, uh, people that we both know and talk to uh, on the other side of the fence, it's it, it, this is information that if we were still in the Cold War in like the 1960s, 1970s, this is information that they would have had to capture people and waterboard people to get. Right. Meanwhile, this is uh, just freely available with high definition pictures and video for the first time in human history. So it's really kind of cool to be as p- a part of that. Like we are seeing this instantly, whereas before we'd have to find some really weird technical manuals or, you know, pick up a Russian out of Afghanistan and, you know, take him to Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> it, like the, it, the, the free flowing exchange of uh, information, even on a declassified level, is extremely new. And that's a cool thing to experience. Well, I, I certainly hope that for our sake, uh, for us, we take that as a, an education or a point of education to where we develop things that matter and understand that is very difficult to, let's say, propagate your way into success. Right. Right. I mean, it's like North Korea, right? They they could they could come up with a snail drum fed, seventy four pattern Kalashnikov and say tell their people that that's so amazing. I I want one of those things. I do I too, mean, but everybody's like, oh, why don't you make this? I'm like, because a, no, and b, <laughs> I'm not convinced theirs works. It could. What I what I'm wondering. So so initially, <laughs> when I saw the AK-12, what I thought was going to happen was that they only had like, you know, 500 of them, and they would just rotate them around the parade field, and then everyone would get 74s. But no, they're actually sending them out, <laughs> kind of like their 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 new revolutionary battle tank. You know, uh, we're, uh, that, we're going on to like a lot of stuff right here. But yes, right. I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot hide defects nearly as easily when you uh when you get into you know basically a territory to where people could get their hands on your equipment and it is so easy to fact check now like reddit will tear you apart if you release a propaganda thing like that and it's like oh well that's that's actually the same gun that was here they're claiming it's here but in the background you could see it's daytime when in reality in this time zone like they they will just they'll, they'll they'll rip it apart and so, like, just the, the free exchange of information like that has been so good for actually, like, just seeing. Unfortunately, it's also being used as another tool for propaganda. But uh, it, if, yeah. you're, if you're willing to look and are willing to vet your sources, it's, it's a very, very good tool for seeing through propaganda more so than receiving it. It's right now, I mean, it's just, just I'm, I'm just trying to take my time to see things. Like the AK-12, we have our hands on two specimens here in Texas. So we are able to examine it in person. And I think, again, you know, this is out there for people who are leaving comments. If this conversation upset you anyway, and you are indeed a successful VDV Russian paratrooper who has conquered for far in foreign lands and the AK-12 has served you well, tell us, how has that served you well? But at the same time, if you have no, like if your only experience of, on this is a Girls Front Line or something like that, yeah, uh, I love the AK-12 in uh, Battlefield 4. And stop picking on my favorite gun. I mean, it looks cool. Don't get yeah. me wrong; it looks cool. It looks rad. Um, it's a great but, wall hanger. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's an interesting conversation piece. Uh, yeah. Let's say Especially for us in the when States. it's when it's behind your desk uh, as a Ukrainian colonel. Um, I, I, you said that, Brandon. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, it's just stuff I talked about before where it's the new crick or like that's mm-hmm. where you had uh, uh, big, big uh, Osama uh, was posing with cranks in the background or whatever. Cause that, that's all. It was like a, uh, I guess a title almost 
where it was, uh, you know, I, I am big dog because I have this gun. It's funny to see trends like that throughout history where maybe in, you know, World War II for America, it was, you know, having an STG-44 behind you or something, or just taking photos mm -hmm. with that. Whereas the now Luger. it's the AK-12. The Luger. Yeah, yeah, the Luger. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just the next but evolution. The Luger is actually good, though. Yeah, I like my Luger. I think it's kind of cool. Yeah, it is great, and it's 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 funny because the the grip is so awkward because you have to break your wrist downward, but it's actually great for shooting at a negative thirty degree angle. Hmm. It's, it's almost, almost like, like they designed it this way. The, is your target right in front of you at a lower field, about two meters ahead? And I will give them credit for actually asking their officers what they needed. Oof, you're old, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, this is right. how I never get invited back to do stuff like this. So. No, come yeah. on, man. No, this is this was a lively conversation, and and you made it. You just sprinkled enough of the Tabasco on there, right? <laughs> right, right. Or shall I say, uh, German mustard on there at the very end. There you go. A little bit of sauerkraut. Now. Um, is there anything else you would like to add to the conversation? I mean, I know we could go, honestly, we could go on for hours, but, uh, Pretty much. we have to conclude it at some point and go eat dinner. Right. Um, but I don't know. Is there anything that you feel like we left out on this conversation? Uh, I, I think we have an open window here to see in the next, maybe probably year or so where this goes, especially now that it is seeing combat. I'm interested to see what, what happens. And realistically, this is, I guess it's just important to note, especially since YouTube is forever. Um, the uh, just not for creators, <laughs> uh, but the, it's interesting to, to, to basically be self-aware and that this is, we're referring to the AK 12 as we have it now not what it will be or what they could do to it. They could, you know, come out with uh, just upgrade kits like the AK-19 stocks with the longer handguards and, you know, a new securing system. It's something like that that makes this a significantly better firearm. That could happen. Will it happen? I have no clue. But we're just remarking about it as it is now, as what we have in front of us. Well, uh, yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, at the year 2022, and again, you know, we are deliberately trying to be a little bit more careful with some of the remarks that we make because uh, nobody likes to see war crimes being committed. And right now, this thing seems to be imminently associated with some of those um, uncouth activities. And escalating. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so at a later date i mean i don't know who knows maybe in um 5 10 years uh we could we could even you know think back at this conversation that we're having about the ak12 and see what's developed or or whether like you said like like you postulated um the r&d money has gone because at right. this point uh let's say uh, economics are uh, a little uh, a little muddy hmm. Whatever R and D money there is uh, now left, it's approximately twenty percent less than it was a month and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think it'd be a conversation that's interesting for for a future date for us to kind of revisit and think back about. Um, for sure, yeah. And you're you're a, you're a very enlightening person to talk to. I, I enjoy these chats, and uh, this is uh, this is just kind of a fun mental exercise because you come at things from I, I come at things from more of a I don't know, a nerdy kind of technical, like you, you're asking about accuracy breakdowns. I'm like, man, I just wanted to make, make sure the gun works and see how it works and everything. And like, there's just, it, it's, it's a, it's an interesting yin yang kind of thing. Cause it's, it's, you, you're more in a field that I don't really get to see very often. So you kind of get me to think about things in a different perspective. Yeah, no, it, I mean, likewise, likewise. And honestly, that's why this is so interesting because we almost came up with the exact same conclusions between you and I. And then to find out that over across the pond, uh, the Polinar guys came out with the exact same conclusions as we did. Unscripted, un, uh, unplanned, entirely just out of chance. And I mean, this is one, two, Josh and I, three, and then the three of them, six people around the world. Uh, coming up with this exact conclusion with rare examples of AK-12s that, that we were able to get a hold of. Actually, they can get them for 1,500 euros still, but we, we cannot. No, I would love to. I would buy a crate. Um, but the, you know, and it makes me really doubt that 
the folks in Russia that were giving them feedback on this rifle didn't have similar conclusions as well. Since we all, from different backgrounds, including an Eastern European, more ex-Soviet type of military mindset, came to the same conclusion. We came to the, eh. at a certain point, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, the Russians ran out of money. Ah, uh, we'll find out in a few years, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and that'll be the interesting part. We get to watch this. Uh, our our predictions, I guess, unfold in real time, and get to see if we're really just bad at it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'd say until then, though, Brandon, uh, if there's nothing else. Yeah, I, I'm 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 good with you. I think we pretty much covered everything. Um, but yeah, no, it's been a been a fantastic time talking with you. Yeah. Well. Whichever side this uh, publishes, we'll see you guys around. Feel free to comment and tell us what you think about the AK-12. And be sure to subscribe to both of our channels because we desperately need it. <laughs> That's right. YouTube care of doesn't it. like us. <laughs> yeah, yeah we have some more conversation on that. But yes, everybody take care. Five one six is Jill Knight six four six eight packs red con one green to green top copy over. Jill Knight six this is five one six Roger over. One six Jill Knight one one pack green green over. Five one six Roger over. One six Jill Knight two one big two two packs red con one over.